I don't think it's an exaggeration to say all of our sexual crookedness, all of our, when, when stuff is coming out sideways in mm -hmm. our sexuality, it's because we don't know how to pray. Mm. And, and I mean prayer here, not in like the third grade CCD right. class way we learn to pray. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, Hail Mary, full of grace, mm -hmm. Lord. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about prayer as I learned it from Pope Benedict XVI, who says, here he's quoting the fathers of the church or summarizing their teaching. He says, the fathers of the church tell us that prayer, properly understood, is nothing other, nothing other than becoming a longing for God. And that longing, this is affirmed by mm -hmm. Pope Benedict XVI, by John Paul II, and they get this all the way back from the fathers of the church. That longing for God is properly called, in the language of the church, which she borrows from the Greeks, it's properly called eros. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And in, I know in my upbringing, I know in yours because I know you so well, that's not what we were taught. When, when I was raised, the erotic realm, eros, the erotic realm, and the realm of prayer and the holy were just two separate realities yeah. altogether. Mm -hmm. And when we do that, we have human sexuality over here and spirituality, prayer, mm -hmm. over here. And that's why we have a disintegrated, painful experience yeah. of marital intimacy. Yeah. Because mar I'm just, I'll quote John Paul II. He says, marital intimacy is meant to be liturgical. What? 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 What does that even mean? What does it mean to be liturgical? Liturgical is to, to be a pr praising God for the, the goodness of creation. It's, it's a return to the creator mm -hmm. of the gift of mm -hmm. creation. That's what liturgy is. Mm -hmm. uh, bless us, O Lord, and, and no, not bless us, O Lord, in these thy gifts. What's the, uh, what's the, <laughs> blessed are what's, you, Lord God. Yes, blessed are you, yeah. Lord God of all creation, mm -hmm. for through your goodness we have received yeah. the bread we offer you. Right? We are offering back to God the fertility of creation. Uh, and, and people don't tend to think in these terms, but I'm just unfolding the yeah. truth here of what the Mass is. What are we doing in the Mass? We are putting nature's nuptials on an altar. Bread. What is bread? Bread comes from the crushed endosperm of the flowering wheat plant. What is a flower? A flower is nature's, one of nature's most beautiful reproductive organs. We take the endosperm of that flowering plant. Endosperm means the seed within the seed. Mm -hmm. We crush it, we bake it, we put it on an altar. We take the ovary of the fertile, uh, the, the ovary of the, the grapevine, mm -hmm. of the flowering grapevine. We take that ovary, we crush it, we ferment it, we put it on an altar. And then the Holy Spirit comes through the prayer of the priest. Let the Holy Spirit come upon these gifts like the dewfall. Dewfall is necessary for flowers to be fertile, to reproduce. But this is where grace perfects nature. And that dewfall coming down on those gifts, uh, these, this nature's fertility, literally becomes, if the mass is real, nature's fertility on the altar in the Mass become, becomes the fertility of Mary's womb. Mm -hmm. What is the fertility of Mary's womb? It's Jesus Christ. How did that happen? A woman, Mary, as a bride, with all the pure yearning of Eros, now we're, we're coming full circle here, for Mary, who has never fallen, her Eros was always a prayer. Her eros was never coming out sideways. Her eros was never misdirected. Her eros was a longing for God. And as bride, she opens that longing to the Creator, the eternal bridegroom, and the Holy Spirit comes upon her. She says, how am I going to conceive? I do not have sexual relations with a man. And we could, we could substitute the words of the prophet Hosea here for, for the angel's response you will know the Lord. The Lord will betroth himself to you forever and you will know the Lord. 
That biblical word know, as John Paul II unfolds in the theology of the body, goes back to Adam knew his wife Eve and she conceived. That biblical word know is how Jesus himself describes mm-hmm. heaven. Mm-hmm. This is eternal life, that you would know the one true God. That's what Mary experienced at the Annunciation. She came to know in the full biblical sense of that word. Be scandalized if it causes scandal. It's, it's biblical scandal. She came to know virginally the love of the eternal bridegroom. She knew it and she conceived. This is where grace perfects nature. She offers all of her natural sexuality. I know to many people, we have Mary over here and sexuality over here. Mary was sexual. She was a woman. That's right. Yeah. Uh, to say Mary was sexual does not mean she was sexually active. Mm-hmm. She was a virgin her whole life. But her virginity here does not mean the absence mm-hmm. of union. Mm-hmm. It means the perfection of union. It means union with love eternal. She is the bride of love eternal. That's who Mary is. That is her, her very identity is the bride of love eternal. And in that eros, Mary's eros, her yearning for God, open to God. Remember her eros never came out sideways. It was always directed at the Lord. She conceives the eternal son of God. And she offers back to God what God offered to her. That's liturgy. So all of that, that whole just (laughs) adventure we just went on with the Blessed Mothers to come back to, why does John Paul II say the marital embrace is supposed to be liturgical? Because what are we supposed to be doing? Like Mary at the Annunciation, a husband and wife are meant to be opening the one body they become to the presence Mm -hmm. of the divine, Mm -hmm. the Holy Spirit. Who's the Holy Spirit? The Lord and giver of life. Mm -hmm. What is the sexual act saying? It's proclaiming life-givingness, which is why when we render it sterile, which is very different than a couple past childbearing years or the natural time of infertility in a woman's cycle, but when we willfully render the sexual act sterile, it's anti-liturgical. We, we don't want the Holy Spirit to come down upon us. We don't want the Lord and giver of life to be part of this. And it gets turned back in on ourselves. And instead of loving one another, we end up using one another. And that to the degree that we are not loving one another but using one another, that is the roots. That is the deepest root of the friction, the tension, the resentment, the I don't feel loved, I feel rejected. Mm -hmm. How does that heal? The only way that heals at its roots is for that woman to learn how to take her yearning for union with the bridegroom to Jesus and for that husband to learn how to take his desire for union with the bride Mm -hmm. to Mary and to learn how to experience that in a in a virginal way and here again virginity does not mean the absence of union it means the perfection of union and i would say in my experience um in my own marriage too this this is what you're talking about is is the kind of the ultimate picture the ultimate goal and i think where the real disconnect is oftentimes is how does that translate to what i'm really doing in my bedroom with my wife yeah how does that translate to that and I think what I what I I don't want someone to hear what you're saying and think, well, am I just supposed to be a virgin in my marriage and not have sexual intimacy? No, the the goal is what you're painting the picture of how holy this is. Yes, we yes. call the Eucharist Holy Communion. Yes, for yes. a reason because it brings us into union. What's supposed to be happening in my bedroom is a holy communion. And that's not just an analogy. It no, is an analogy, yeah. but it's not just an analogy. It's a sacrament. For Catholic Christians, it's a sacrament. Which means it really communicates that's the right. mystery. We're really doing that. And that's the question. Are we really doing that? So do I open myself up to the, to the heart of Jesus, to the heart of Mary, and I take my longings there first, so that, not, not so that I don't desire to be Correct. with my wife, but so that in the manner in which I desire my wife, and the intimacy I participate in with my wife is directed in the same direction. 
is bringing me into communion with her, yes. into communion with God, and it's a holy yes. Yes. communion. Yes. And that means being a gift. I'm not worried about the other person more than I am myself. I'm open to life. All those things that, that you said. That's really like, I think that's the that's the heart and the healing of that rejection that a man or a woman yes. would experience. Yes. And and I know I'm 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 putting out. You know, in the span of the last 10 minutes, I put out a lot of heavy duty stuff. And I'm sure viewers are out there like, what? If you're hearing this for the first time, you're like, whoa, 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 whoa. I mean, not only do I not only not get what he's saying, what practical bearing does that this yeah. have on my life? And how do I connect those dots when they've been so disconnected? Yeah. We, we just have to start where we are with our brokenness and acknowledge something is not right. That's why there's resentment. That's why there's rejection. That's why there's pain. And we have to really humble ourselves and entrust ourselves to the Redeemer who came into the world, as the Catechism says, to restore creation to the purity mm -hmm. of its origins mm -hmm. when man and woman were naked and felt no shame. Mm -hmm. Why were they naked without shame? John Paul II says, because their eros, their yearning, was rightly directed. It was not directed at the other as an object for my satisfaction. Mm -hmm. It was directed towards the other as, as to be a gift yeah. and to receive the gift of the other. That's what we want in our deepest yeah. being. Yeah, exactly. But all of us have to wrestle with how twisted up our desires have become because of what we call original sin. It's okay that we're broken, as I often say. It's okay that we're broken because there's a remedy. It's called the redemption. Uh, St. Paul calls it, in fact, the redemption of the body, mm -hmm. right? There's a solution here. There's a remedy. So it's okay that we're broken, but it is not okay to call our brokenness health. It is not okay to dig my heels in mm -hmm. and just say, it's mm -hmm. your fault. That's right. Um, if you just were more desirous of the marriage bed, then we wouldn't be having this tension in our relationship. Well, she can throw that right back and say, well, if you really loved me as you were meant to love me, maybe I'd be more desirous. Mm. Uh, let, let's just put it this way. If we, can, if we can admit, if we can just go, it's 50-50, right? We're both broken. Uh, and, and the marital embrace makes both the man and the woman incredibly vulnerable. Mm. Incredibly vulnerable. The, the, the woman must open herself in the most vulnerable way. And, and, and when she's wounded there in her heart, what she ends up doing is she opens her legs, but she closes her heart. And if a woman is doing that over and over again in a marriage, she's, every, t every time they come together, there's a rupture happening yeah. in her between body and soul. And there's a name for the rupture of body and soul. It's death. And when the man is also rejected there, when he, he puts himself, I mean, quite literally, she's opening her body, mm -hmm. but he's putting himself yep. out there. That's right. He is naked and out there in a most vulnerable <laughs> way. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and, and every man wants to kind of cop this macho attitude and say, I'm, I'm in control here. I'm, I'm, I'm lord of what's going on here. This is, this is not going to wound me. or Oh, BS. I, I don't buy it. Every man is so vulnerable mm -hmm. right there. And so the possibility of a deep rejection wound right there is very real. Yeah, it's very, very real. real. And, and look at God's kind of remarkable, at least the starting point of the remedy here in the Old Testament for the man. Because he can be he can be afraid of that vulnerability, and he can hide behind that kind of macho facade. The remedy that God offers to Abraham and all his offspring is, dude, you're hiding. You're hiding. Uh, with the fall, ever since the fall, you've mm -hmm. been hiding. Mm -hmm. I was afraid because I was naked, so I hid myself. That's Adam's cry. That's every man's cry. And not only does God, in effect, say, not only should those fig leaves be removed here, I want you to remove even the natural covering of the most intimate aspect of your anatomy. Mm -hmm. What the heck is going on yep. there? 
Well, we come to learn in the New Testament that the circumcision of the flesh is a foreshadowing of the circumcision of the heart. Mm -hmm. And there's that big debate in the early church. Do Gentiles who become Christian need to be circumcised? And the early church concludes no, because what the Lord's really after is the circumcision of your heart. But what we're, we're, what we're learning right here in Scripture, I'll just say it as it is, the way to a man's heart is his loins. That's how you get there. <laughs> and the circumcision of the flesh is a very visceral, get you where it hurts image of, of what is required in, in an authentic human relationship and in our relationship with the Lord. It's the total exposure of our hearts. That's the most intimate aspect of our huma mm -hmm. humanity. Mm -hmm. The loins are just the outward sign of that inmost place mm -hmm. that needs to be exposed. And to the degree that a man is attempting to make love to his wife with an uncircumcised heart, she's going to feel not loved as she's meant to be loved. And that will breed resentment. Uh, and to the extent that the woman is also not dilating her heart, and there's the feminine image, right? And that's right out of Scripture too. To the extent that the woman is not dilating her heart to receive the gift of the man, the man's going to feel rejected there. And there is this ongoing, like, our, our brokenness here is complementary in that it throws us into deeper resentment of one another. You're broken, I'm broken, I hurt you, you hurt me. Somebody in this dynamic of you hurt me, I hurt you, you hurt me, I hurt you, and we're getting further and further apart. Somebody in this dynamic has to take the initiative of saying, I will expose my wounded, broken heart to the Redeemer to learn how to love in a better way. And John Paul II says, in that dynamic of restoring the balance of love to the sexual relationship, the man has a, not an exclusive responsibility, but a particular responsibility. Why? And I would say, because look at the anatomy. We are the giver of the gift. Uh, and so we have a particular, not an exclusive again, but a particular responsibility to, to, not that we can perfectly ensure, but that we can, with sincerity, commit ourselves to the journey of that circumcision of the heart so that we are really making a naked, vulnerable, this is my body given mm -hmm. up for you kind of gift. And this is, of course, Jumping right into Ephesians 5, husbands, love your wives as Christ loved mm -hmm. the church. Well, that's nice in theory, nice idea. I mean, I inscribed in Wendy's engagement ring. I was all gung-ho about this. As Christ, so I. That's what I chiseled into her engagement ring. I was going to be the man who did this. And then, boom, I had to confront how my broken humanity not only doesn't know how to do that, but doesn't want to do that. And that means a real death to my broken humanity to learn how to, to love. And my wife has to go through her own version of that from the female perspective to learn how to, to love me. Um, and that means this journey is going to be, if we're really following Jesus, it's going to be a bloody mess that leads to glory. And that's the liturgy. That's what makes the marriage bed liturgical. It's a bloody mess that leads to glory. It's a real, real, as you were saying earlier, it's not just an analogy. It's a sacrament, which means it is a real participation mm -hmm. in the Paschal mystery, the death and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And I'll, I'll close with this. John Paul II says in his, his letter on uh, uh, Familiaris Consortio, uh, which is on the, the dignity of the family, the vocation of the family in the modern world. He says, um, spouses are the constant reminder 
to the church and the world of what happened at the cross. And again, we're back to our poverty and just falling on our knees and say, Lord, I need you, your strength to flow through my weakness. And then we learn the lesson painfully over time, the all essential lesson, when I am weak, then I am strong. When I'm vulnerable, when my heart is circumcised, then I'm learning the power of divine love. There's no other way. That's that's the that's the path. Amen. Thank you.